that entire conversation to really just you know have you know what i mean but here we are anyway no worries um let's see here before we dive into one of the reasons why we're here um i like to start my interviews off a little bit of a softball and what to you first what was your first job in the movie and tv industry <laughs> uh well tv specifically uh I was, I started my career, I started out as a radio DJ. Uh, so that was my first job in entertainment that I would say, uh, that was my first job. Then when I started working uh, in uh, TV, I was working for a promo uh, department at a network in, as a local network in Mexico City. So I started writing, uh, it was, they wanted to capture the youth you know, the younger audience. And I was the one kid from college who showed up and they were like, I guess you'll do, you tell us what the young people want. So I was like, okay. So I, uh, I, I was writing their copy for their promos. That was my first job. Jason? I worked for a producer named Arnold Copelson, who was an Academy Award-winning producer. He passed away a couple of years ago, but um, uh, he had won an Oscar for Platoon. And he had had a second nomination for The Fugitive. And I was fortunate enough to work for him uh, during The Seven, Devil's Advocate, Perfect Murder, The Eraser. Not his best movies, but big movies nonetheless. And um, that was my first job in, uh, in, in film. In television, it was uh, I produced a TV show called Are We There Yet? Which was on TBS with um, Ice Cube. And so that was my first foray into television. A follow up to that is you guys created and co written movies and TV shows and now production company as well. But I want to start from the beginning. How did you two meet? Uh, well, um, I think Jason tells the better version of that story. <laughs> as... uh, uh, simply put, Ricky, I. Um, my first boss at Copelson, funny how it all ties back to that, uh, was a man named Sanford Panich, who's now president of Columbia Pictures. And uh, he's sort of been a mentor angel on my shoulder, my career. And um, I was meeting with him and he was excited because he had just signed an overall deal with Eduardo based on the success, the, the worldwide success of Instructions Not Included that he and Eugenio Derbez made. And so the way he introduced Eduardo to me was almost like a Lawrence of Arabia type introduction. It was like, you have to meet this guy. He is the Judd Apatow of Mexico. He has created all these hit shows. Now he wrote and produced this biggest Spanish language movie of all time. I was like, Yes, yes, I, I want to meet him. I want to meet him. And so Sanford kind of set us, he, at the time he was president of Fox International uh, back when 20th was around. And um, he kind of set us up on a meet cute uh, in, a, in a conference office uh, in the executive building at Fox. And I had come so excited to meet Eduardo. I had prepared 10 ideas because I had read since he called Eduardo the Judd Apatow of Mexico, that Judd Apatow used to go to meetings and have, if somebody wanted one joke, he had 10 jokes. So that's how he won over Jim Carrey and Ben Stiller and whatnot and Sandler back in the early days. So I came in with 10 ideas, excited to pitch Eduardo, and he didn't even like one of them. <laughs> that was my misfortune. <laughs> But I think he liked my enthusiasm, so he let me have a, a second meeting, and and we did that one. At, at, we had a lunch, and from then on, uh, I, 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 it almost was that easy, in hindsight. But in in reality, we had another lunch. We finally came up with an idea together that that we liked, and then we worked on it together. We pitched it to Fox. We sold it to Fox, and that thus begun the partnership. And that was about eight years ago. Uh, if I um, the the most crucial part of information about that meeting, the second meeting is that first meeting we had uh, we 
uh, at our our conversation at a conference room of, in uh, the Fox lot. And then I asked them, uh, we were talking about New York, and I told him that I never tasted cronuts. And he said that he knew a place in LA where they sold cronuts. And so the next time we were looking for cronuts, which we didn't find, I'm starting to think that he didn't know and he just made it up so we could keep chatting. I think but I didn't know. <laughs> I totally forgot that, Eduardo. I totally forgot about I just, that. I just remember that right now because I'm like, yes, what was that second? And they were like, oh, we, were, we were in Beverly Hills looking for the Corona place that didn't exist. And, but <laughs> he told me, it was funny because he told me a story. We're just like spitballing. He told me a story from, uh, you know, some, you know, very in passing, this funny thing that happened to him connecting to somebody else's cell phone. And then I was like, that's it. That's the movie. What if this, 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 this? And we're like, okay, we, we came up with this concept. We sold to Fox. And it's been uh, still in development. <laughs> now it's, you know, went from Fox and National to 20th to Searchlight to Disney to this, but but we moved on and we're, uh, that's how we're uh, partnerships. Eventually went to New York on a uh, work trip and we found the Cronuts. So that that part has a, that project went, we could see all the way through. Right, I can't wait for you guys to come out with the Cronut movie. Um, <laughs> it, like the cronut itself, it will be ultimately be disappointing. Oh my god! Oh. Thank you. Oh man! All right. So season two of Acapulco. I adored season one so much, and I love. There's so many different things about the show that I think are unique and different from stuff that we're typically seeing on TV. A lot of stuff we're seeing right now is kind of rehash stuff none of this to me feels rehashed and i love all the different dynamics of the characters there's a lot of different things i want to go in detail about but one of the things i want to ask though is is intriguing for me what are some of the challenges you face writing a second season to a show of this nature um well there's one i'll tell you first about the advantages of first season the, the, the second season is that there was so much stuff that didn't fit into the first season uh that we had already by the time we started writing the second season we already knew that there were stuff that we had to get to uh the challenges is that we have the the challenge of of the show uh which was very enticing when we pitched it and we when we presented to to apple but once we got to the writer's room it was a big challenge is just the idea of having two parallel storylines to have something going on in the present that is tied to the past and that kind of you're discovering almost at the same time on both timelines certain information it's very tricky <laughs> you you would not believe the amount of time that you have to you know kind of hold your cards close to your vest in the present so you didn't you know tip the hand on the past so that was very challenging, especially because we what one thing we wanted is just to give a little bit more information about to present day Maximo. Uh, we were always very cautious not to make the present day story because Eugenio is such a big star. He's so charismatic. He has this great chemistry with uh, uh, Rafael Alejandro, who plays his nephew. So we don't want the scale to tip too much to they became more a show about the present than the past. Uh, and also we only have, him for, he's a busy guy. We only have him for a few days. <laughs> we can only shoot so much with him. Uh, but we wanted to, you know, to, to, for the audience to feel satisfied that they were starting to connect the, that story from that kid from Acapulco who is, you know, uh, broke, struggling. And how did he become this uh, millionaire? And from so we kind of want to move that a little bit more uh, because you can't really get to that point yet in the past because <laughs> it's still a couple of seasons ahead. But I, you also need in the present to start getting a little bit of like an idea, not only about his money, but also why he has so much regret and why why is it that he doesn't want to go back to Acapulco, those kind of things. So um, 
Jason. <laughs> <laughs> on a on a, a light note, Ricky, one of the challenges is that Raphael, the kid who plays Hugo, you know, is is aging before our very eyes, yet that present day story is supposed to be kind of continuous one day after the other. And so we were joking like season three, knock on wood, like he's gonna be like 18 years old, but in the story, he's still gonna be like 13. <laughs> I'm just gonna and... make a joke. Like, I feel like I've been listening to the story forever. It's only been two days. Yeah. <laughs> right, there's a bit of two day story. He's aged so much. Yeah. I feel like I'm going weird I... now. I can only give a, a reference to the Rocky series because I once saw Rocky one through six in a row. And it's quite uh, fascinating because the son, Rocky's son, ages like six, seven years per film, but each film starts where the other film ended. So it's like, wait, when he went into the fight, Rocky's kid was three and now he's nine. And you kind of just go with it. So uh that's what we can only <laughs> hope for i never noticed that you're right i would also say ricky that uh as someone who grew up on very specific comedies i'll just say like seinfeld friends family ties um i always appreciated that when you went back and especially in syndication you're able to see often the first seasons of things you watch the first seasons of a lot of those shows and they're very rough. They're working stuff out. You can tell. And they're, the actors are trying to find their characters. The writers are trying to find where the comedy plays the best and, and the heart and whatnot. And so now that we were through season one and we had cast these wonderful actors, we had gotten to know these characters and the setting and the tone. I specifically was excited of the challenge of trying to like, you know, go for some harder comedy, go for some bigger laughs. Now that we knew the actors uh, well, we knew their voices uh, and we knew what we felt we, where we could stretch the tone, maybe go broad a little bit, then rein it back and give you some more heart. So that to me, that was a fun challenge of, of trying to go for some things that maybe we would have been too hesitant to do in season one yeah so obviously you talk about eugenia and and that's he's a different animal of his own but for me this season enrique is brilliant right his act like there I, it's crazy to me because there's so many layers to his story right you know what i mean and there's so much heart there but at the same time he's funny and he's kind of like cluelessly funny in some aspects as well so i love take me behind casting him initially and kind of watching that character grow from season one to two, you know, behind the camera there. Well, it's casting in general on the show is just so tricky because first and foremost, it's a comedy. So people have to be funny. They have to have comedic chops. So any comedy show that you write, it's already challenging to find people with that that skill to be funny to have good timing to understand the material uh you always want people that take that the, the the script you know up a couple notches and make it funnier and add their own stuff so then then we were looking for this young kid which you know normally uh every network every studio the first thing they want is for you to bring them a star but Latino or not, there are not that many people that age who could carry a show. So if they're not a star, they have to feel like a star. They have to be charismatic. Uh, so in, we were very lucky to find Enrique because on top of everything that I'm saying, on top of they have to, he had to be Latino. He had to look like a local kid from Acapulco. We were very adamant about making sure that the community and the the culture were. Uh, represented well accurately uh and um he has to be funny in english he had to be funny in spanish <laughs> uh it was a whole wish list and uh with a good accent in spanish good enough accent in english uh and uh and yes and and and, and it was it, it was a long search to find that person that uh like who we all agreed could could embody and but on top of it i think specifically to this character 
because a lot of what I'm saying could apply to other characters, but this character, uh, you know, from the beginning of the story that they're more and more they're going to start doing questionable things. And even in the pilot, he it's the first little threshold, little boundary that he crosses when he, at the end of the pilot, he tells his mom, like, I didn't do anything but wrong. And he know he know he did it. And he, to your point, uh, something that I, I, I think he doesn't get enough credit uh, I think Enrique plays all the layers of what he's saying in that scene. Like he's saying one thing, but you know, inside he's thinking something different or he's putting on this happy face, but inside he's dying. Uh, so uh, we have to find somebody that we just find charismatic enough that even when there's like in the straddling that line between what's wrong and what, what's right, we're on board with their journey and with that we find them fascinating uh and yes i think it's a, it's it's a it's a very it's very uh i think relatable for most of us uh but especially for people in the latino community in the united states like where they go from their home that might be more conservative that be spanish speaking etc and they're thrown into this environment where like everybody speaks english everybody has more money everybody's white it, you know there are all these different things that they have to navigate uh, and so that's one thing I think we both like about the show that we can kind of talk about those things without really being overt about it. Like you can watch a show and just have fun with it. And we love that. You can also watch a show and start thinking, wait a minute, what are they trying to say? There's something here that relates to something else and, and that speaks to a larger issue. Uh, so we like to that you can see, you can choose <laughs> uh, e either layer. Yeah, I think that's one of the things, like you're right, the, the the performance there is so layered and it's so unique because it's, and then the other side of it, at his age in the in the movie or in the series, it's very relatable at that age, right? You know what I mean? Like, I can't tell you how many times in my life I never out loud said what I really wanted to say to my parents, you know what I mean? Or out loud wanted to say something to a girl or, you know, what, whatever that is, it's so perfectly relatable. And And I want to follow that up to something fun now. The singing duo by the pool, okay? It is the greatest thing ever created. I love it. I look forward to it each episode, whether it's song, whether they're singing. It's perfect. Like, where did that idea stem from? And and yes, I just, first off, amazing idea. Whoever came up with it, congratulations. It's one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. But, uh, and even the episode where, um, <laughs> even the episode where they, I don't even know how far along we're, I've already seen a lot, almost of season two. But when they got fired or whatever, I was like, no, we can't. And then it was like, I literally like audibly, I'm like in the middle of working, watching it. I'm like, I audibly yelled at my team. No, don't fire them. That's the best, my favorite part. But uh, just take me behind the idea. And did you think it would be as rewarding as it has been? I have to say it's been a, an, an immensely pleasant surprise. Uh, <laughs> Eduardo and I came up with it for two reasons. One, because one of the first things we bonded about when we met each other was our love of musicals. We are both obsessed with Broadway musicals, musical film musicals, and we both adore them. We're fans, we are admirers, we like want to do them, uh, but we're also like in reverence to the great ones. And so, it was a late addition to the pilot script for for one of the reasons is because we love 80s music and we wanted to make sure that at least some 80s music made it into each show. So how can we do that? Well, let's put some singers at the pool. Even though Eduardo was like, I don't know if this is like really what they would have at, at this pool. We were like, maybe it doesn't matter. It could just be a fun element to the background of the pool. So when we were casting them, uh, it was originally just sort of background characters. And um, these two amazing people, they would work so hard and they came, when it was their day to shoot those scenes, season one, they would come so prepared with these outfits and these lavish dance moves to the song we had picked the song, so we knew what song they were going to sing, but we didn't know to the extent that they were going to bring it 
And it was obvious almost from the pilot on, like these are amazing uh, characters and actors performing them. We need to bring, we need to give them more to do. So in season one, on the fly, we started giving them lines in the show. We started seeing if we could make them part of the family of Las Colinas. And then season two, we were like, well, now, now they are part of the family. Let's see how much fun we can have with them. And so we hope to dig deeper with them in, in future seasons. I love that. I love it. Um, I want to make sure. So Rockmere, right? Rockmere? Is that right? Rockmere Entertainment? Rackmar. Rackmar. It's, um, Rackmar. Uh, Eduardo's mom's name is Raquel, and my mom's name is Marsha. So we... I love that. I love that. So I love the idea that you're using this, obviously, to bring some more uh, Latino representation to the big screen and small screen. Take me behind the creation and kind of what your future goals are with it within the industry. Well, um, I would say that first and foremost, like Jason said, when we started uh, our, our collaboration and our creative partnership, we just started geeking out about movies and in particular, the, the big uh, common passion was just the remembering how it felt to be a kid growing up in the 80s and every summer going to this uh, big idea, big concept uh, movies from the Amblin movies and uh, John Hughes, like all that stuff. So we were basically uh, passionate about just creating big stories like that. We So our, our commitment is first and foremost to be, to, to push the boundaries of entertainment and see how thrilling it can be to see in, in the, the crazy new narratives we can find. Um, but the, the, the question is almost for us, like how can we take the spirit of that and make it fit in the modern world? And a lot of it has to do with making sure that it represents the world the way it is right now, the world we live both live in in my case, coming, you know, being a Mexican immigrant, coming from uh, a, a Latino background, by being bilingual, being an out gay man, like making sure that everybody's included and in telling it from that perspective. We, you know, we haven't seen many other perspectives tell, tell those same type of stories. So it's, uh, if you, we want to think that so far the common thread of the things that we've written that, that together, the things that we have produced, that they're uh, stories with a lot of creativity and a lot of emotion. A lot, I think that that's the way it was back then. They were very inventive and they're very original. Uh, and they also had a lot of heart. There was not a lot of uh, cynicism back then. So uh, the question is, how do you do it? How do you make it, uh, how do you connect it to the world we live today? How do we connect it to the technology we have today? Um, so that's in, 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 in graded terms. So in our day to day, like we might have to make sure that we have, uh, we hire, we have hired like female directors, people of color as directors uh, in front of the camera, the stars or protagonists have been like, you know, strong female characters or again, queer people, people of color uh, and, um, um we we kind of want to inject that uh rather I don't, I don't think we see ourselves as like a message or like a social production company but i doubt that you'll find a movie or a tv show or project where there won't be a something that will make you think and acapulco is an example of that i don't think it will be labeled as like, like a latino issue show but it's it very much goes does like a deep cut <laughs> into into the scenes of what it feels like to grow up in a Latino household. A lot of the, the you know, Maximo's family is how I grew up. My mom is super religious. Uh, you know, I think everybody in my family immediately <laughs> realized that, that Nora is a lot like my mom. Uh, so yeah, so it's like putting, a gri grabbing those things with let's say like, hey, you know, we've seen this story, we've seen the Stranger Things, we've seen the E.T where the aliens go here, why can the aliens go to a Latino neighborhood? <laughs> why can't it be a brown kid? Why can it be a black girl? Like, uh, 
you know, it's it's just the same amount of fun and it's just as as as, as exciting. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that everybody feels seen and included. I love that. I love that a lot. Um, and and you guys are the, the first two brought the projects. Obviously, uh, we talked a little bit before we went live about Half Brothers, which is just an incredible piece of film. It's hilarious. It's heartfelt. And and at the same time, Alcohuga, it's for me with that series, it's it has your message that is loud and clear, in my opinion, obviously from my point of view. And you hear the you know the the diversity across the board, but it's also very funny, very heartfelt. And um yeah, so my final question to you guys is going to be you guys are ready for like I mean I will knock on we'll walk knock on wood all together but series season three like we're we're locked and loaded right we're ready for it if when you when you I'm going to say when we get the phone call and I said we I'm not even a part of the phone call <laughs> but when, <laughs> we'll make you part of it Ricky. we'll call you we'll text you we'll send you a message like but you guys you guys have I heard a little bit of it whenever you said earlier few few further seasons down the road you guys are locked and loaded right yes in our heads we've talked it through we know where we want to go we're excited about the episodes and the bigger arcs that we always intended for older maximo and younger maximo and uh so we're we're ready to, to answer your question if you watch the whole episode you will know we're already planted stuff that Oh yeah, that has to be addressed. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, what, it was like for me, like trying to sit down with you guys. Like I was like, man, I, I want to have the conversation so I can put it out here. But I also don't want to be like, I don't want to go. Di I don't want to dive too deep because I want to at least put it out there. But put a like loud thing, spoiler alert. But I didn't want to do that. So. <laughs> but um, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for your time today. Serious, I love, love, love the series. Um, it, it, congratulations on the success, and like I said, cheers to the future for both of you and season three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 22 of Alcohol. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, we, we appreciate your, your a lot. passion and enthusiasm means a lot to us. We really appreciate it.